again. Glad to have you here with us this morning. It's the most wonderful time of year. I'm so glad to have my family with me. We pray for those who are unable to be with their families. And in those places we need to stand in and be their family for them. This week we continue on our series of the road to Bethlehem. Over the past few weeks we've looked at a few things. Specifically we realized we needed to know why did God have to send Jesus? Why did he have to send his son? Why did he have to come to earth? Why did he have to come at all? Not just in the way that he came, but why did he have to come at all? And we realize the answer to why we have Christmas is found in John 3.16 and John 3.17. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world that the world would be condemned, but that through him the world might be saved. There was no other way than for Christ to come. And we begin to look at why roads exist. The road to Bethlehem is the name of the series. And why do we have roads? And roads exist for only one purpose. To get from one point to another point. And what we're looking at here, we need to find a way to be able to get back to God. We, who separated ourselves from God. If you begin to read and go back in your Bible and look at the very beginning of Genesis. We see that at one time we walked in the garden with God. But by Adam and Eve's sin... We eternally separated ourselves from God. We needed to find a way to get back. We needed to find a way to get back, but everything we tried didn't work. If you begin to immediately read, men try to find a way to get back. If you read the story of the Tower of Babel, they built a big tower and said, look, we will reach up to heaven. It didn't work. It didn't work at all. Men began to come up with their own religions to get back to God. That didn't work. God himself set aside laws and ways for us to be able to come back to him, to be able to follow his laws. Now don't misunderstand, God's laws didn't fail. Our ability to follow those laws failed. Anything that we had to put effort into wasn't going to make it. There had to be a way that would reconnect us to God. But God would have to do all the work, and all we would have to do is simply have faith. So like the hymn says, and the old hymn says, Heaven came down. I'm so thankful at this time of year to realize that heaven came down. God came to bridge a gap that no one else could begin to get us across. There's no other way to God except through Christ Jesus. It seems like such a strange way for God to be able to connect back to us. But that's the way it happened. I began to look at how am I going to get my daughter back home for Christmas. We look at this flight and that flight. I'm like, no, we're going to drive to the, as far as we have to. We want, to. we want a non-stop flight. I don't want anything to happen along the way. Thank God her flight was delayed, what, three, four hours. She had a connecting flight. She never made it in that day. There's just no way. But she drove several hours. She flew in. We drove several hours. We picked, this, we picked her up. And everything works out in the end, not as planned. But yet, the success was exactly as planned. We didn't know what was going to happen that day. But in the end, she was with us. Whenever God began to prophesy in the Old Testament about what I'm going to do, he kept telling what I'm going to do, we couldn't fully understand it. But we knew that what would happen was that God would once again reconnect into us. Heaven came down. It's such a simple concept, but yet it's still so hard to grasp. I've studied the scriptures all my life, and it's still hard to grasp the fact that God became man and dwelled with us. Matthew chapter 18, verses 2 through 3. Jesus called a little child unto him. He placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no sound I enjoy more than the sound of children in church. To me, it echoes off the wall, and it just brings me joy at any time. I love the sound of children in the church. They used to say, that's the church of tomorrow. That's a lie. Children of the church of today. Whether they're two weeks old or 22 years old, they're still our children, and we love to have them in church. We love to know that they're here with us. Christ himself guided the children around. He always said, suffer the little children. I want them here with me. He said, because I'm trying to tell you that you have to have faith like these children have. 
We are all good parents and good grandparents. When our children wake up on Christmas morning, they have no doubt that something is under the tree for them. No doubt. Can you imagine to have faith like the faith of a child? To get up in the morning and say, you know what? I have no doubt that the gift I expect is going to be there. We as Christians have that. We know that when we woke up this morning, Christ himself sat at the right hand of the Father. When we wake up Christmas morning, guess what? Christ himself still sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. We should have the faith of a child. But it's so hard to be able to do because we're all so much smarter than children, right? They say out of the mouth of babies. I will tell you this. My wife has taught for almost 30 years. I've been married all that time. I'll tell you this. Anything that you say in front of your children will be repeated. Out of the mouth of babes comes truth. Be careful what you say in front of your kids and your grandkids. Know that what they speak is true. We as Christians should have the same thing. That we only speak the things that we hear from our Father. If you have any priest, preacher, pastor, mentor that says anything to you that does not line up with the Word of God, you need to reconsider where you are. And I tell my own people in this church, always check me. Recheck what I say and let me know. If you love me, you will tell me if I'm saying something that's not the Word of my Father. One of my greatest joys at this time of year always is the Charlie Brown Christmas. I always go back to childhood. You realize that the, the show is almost 65 years old, or 50, 55 years old, I guess it is now, that it's been going on. Every year it's been playing. Every year I love to watch it. We have it, you know, on Netflix and watch it anytime. I, I love the story. To imagine, as a, as a pastor, I know I only preach about 20 to 30 minutes, to imagine what he was able to do in 30 minutes of time to take the full intensity of everything that was happening at Christmas Everything, the struggles that were going on. He put everything into 30 minutes. Nowadays, with commercials like they are, he's even less than that. But he was able to encapsulate everything, you know, in 30 minutes. And able to do something that relate from a 2-year-old to a 102-year-old. You do imagine, things as we get older, we see the show differently. You begin to see the stresses that sit on Charlie Brown. Children don't understand stress. They, they really don't. They don't see what stress is. As you begin to get older and teenagers, they begin to understand what stress is. And Charlie Brown, is, he's, he's just got such a weight that he bears, so far beyond his years. You know, he's like an old man within a small body. You know, some of us have kids that are like that. They worry about things that are so much larger than their sphere. He has so much stress that, that we just bears on him all the time. See if these sound familiar. I think there must be something wrong with me, Linus. Christmas is coming. But I'm not happy. I don't feel the way I'm supposed to feel. Rats! Nobody sent me a Christmas card today. I almost wish there weren't a holiday season. I know nobody likes me. Why do we have to have a holiday season? Just to emphasize it. You do realize that when people sit and watch this show, they identify with so many things that are going on in there. This is the most joyous time of the year. We sing the songs. That's what the song says. This is the most joyous time of the year for some people that they carry such a burden at this time of year. And like he says, Christmas is coming, but I'm not happy. I don't feel the way I'm supposed to feel. How can this young kid, he's supposed to be about 10 years old, maybe, how does he know how he's supposed to feel? Because he just sees the joy of the people around him and he doesn't feel it. He knows something is missing. We at our age, sometimes we can get to that point and say, you know, there's something that is missing. It's Christmas, but it doesn't feel like Christmas. What does Christmas feel like? Charlie Brown, he's saying he's wandering among all these fake Christmas trees, which are an analogy of all the things of Christmas that aren't really Christmas. And he's wandering through all these trees. Remember the pink and all the different kind of colors you can imagine. Aluminum trees, steel trees, everything but what's real. He begins to look at all the bright lights around him. He worries how Christmas is becoming too commercial. You realize these kids don't have any idea what the word commercial even means. That was written to us. But yet they know something's not right. Linus tells Charlie Brown, it's not only getting too commercial, he said it's getting too dangerous. 
Now, what can you imagine in 1965? What's too dangerous about Christmas? If you have YouTube, look at the Black Friday videos of the people fighting over crock pots and TV sets. <laughs> Crawling on the floor. We know someone who will not be named that fought over bath towels one year. It made it on YouTube. I'm excited for that. We were famous in the area. Not anyone in my family. But you can imagine fighting over bath towels at Christmas. You can see where poor Charlie Brown is so pulled. He's like, oh, what is happening here? What is this? The other kids in the store when you're watching, they're all preoccupied with what? They're putting on a Christmas play, right? they got to practice their songs. It's a busy time of year for Janice and for all the others. And the ones who come from Disney and singing. It's a busy time of year. Busy. I've got to do this. I've got to practice. I've got to get everything done. They're thinking about everything else but what needs to actually be done. Christmas just becomes a big production to them. How many in here have gone over your menu and your grocery list at least three times since you came to church, maybe? Because you got to go out to church. Yeah, well, almost, it's almost too late. i got to get to the grocery store. i got to go. i got things i got to do. You become preoccupied with the event instead of the reason for the event. Christmas becomes like a big fireworks show. Some of us that do fireworks on Christmas. Some people think they're crazy. They've never heard of it. We do fireworks on Christmas a lot of us. But you know the fireworks? It goes off and makes a big noise. makes a lot of excitement. But at the end, there's nothing left. Some people, that's how Christmas becomes. Just a big production with nothing left. Sometimes the day or even the entire Advent season, the entire month, can get lost in the shuffle. You know what? Finally, we have to just sit down and like Charlie Brown, we have to just scream as loud as we can. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Me. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. When your friends are around, you say, what is Christmas really all about? Does anybody know what Christmas is all about? You have to say what? Me. Say, hey, listen to me. We all need a lioness in our lives. We all need to be a lioness to others. We all need to be able to say, sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. You realize lioness was not the smartest kid in that whole group. Who was the smartest? And she could have told you she was the smartest. Lucy was the smartest, exactly. Lucy is very smart. She will tell you how smart she is. Lucy turned out the whole reason that Christmas had failed her was because she never got what she asked for for Christmas. She, she was done with Christmas. She never got what she asked for. Lori, what did, Christmas, what did Lucy ask for for Christmas every year? Lucy asked for real estate. <laughs> That's a very wise child. She wasn't the sweetest in the group. The sweetest was Sally, Charlie Brown's little sister, right? So Sally couldn't even write, but she had to get Charlie Brown, hey, write my sound list. I gotta get my Christmas list in early. You know, you gotta get there. He's a busy man. Write my list up on me. So Charlie Brown's a good brother. He sits down and begins to write out his sister's Christmas list. You know, and Sally was just what you needed to do. Open it with a nice greeting. How are you doing? How is your wife, she says. How is your summer? You know, work them into it, smooth them. She was not just sweet, she was smart too. And she gives this big, long thing, she lists and lists. And she finally says, you know what? If it seems too complicated, make it easy on yourself. Just send money. <laughs> she says, how about tens and twenties? So she was sweet, but she had a streak to her as well. She knew how to ask for things, and she just wanted to ask for and then she kind of sounded like a preacher, or at least a TV preacher, you know. All else fails after money. No, Lucy and Sally, they didn't have the answer. They didn't have all the answers. But you know what? Linus had the answer. Remember Linus. Maybe remember that Linus. He never went anywhere without his blanket, right? Remember that? He seemed insecure. But Linus wasn't insecure. Linus had faith. Linus stepped up when his friend was in need. 
And he looked at him when his friend needed something. Whatever he needed, he had there for him. And he looked at his friend and said, sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. And we all know that part of the story. That's the part that we look forward to. It's the part that I don't know if they put in a TV special these days. Linus walked out to the middle of the stage and he told him what? He said, lights, please. And immediately everything is focused on him. Not on him, but on his words. And he said, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord showed round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. And Linus took his blanket and he dropped it on the floor. He dropped his fears. He dropped everything that to him was a level of security. Because the angel told him what? Fear not. He let go of everything that was a man-made security. If he would have been a man of our age, he would have let go of his job. He'd have let go of his money. He'd have let go of what he had in the bank. If he was a college student, he'd let go of his intellect and the things that he's taught to do. He would let go of the things that even his parents may be taught him to do. Everything that was a security to him. Everything that was a place between him and a faith in God, he dropped it to the floor. He thought there were sources of his comfort. But when the angel told him, fear not, he realized that was not where his comfort came from. Linus went on, he said, For behold, I bring unto you glad tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Linus picked up his blanket and he walked back over to Charlie Brown. And the best way to ever wrap up a message I ever heard, he said, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. I understand he didn't have everything together. We're not asked to have everything together. The Apostle Paul wrote three quarters of the New Testament. You know what? The Apostle Paul, St. Paul, did not have it all together. 1 Corinthians 2 2, Paul wrote this. He said, I've decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 8, 2, Paul puts it like this. Listen to this. Listen to this advice, especially those of you that are in college. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 8, 2. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. You know what? I listen to a child dragging around a blanket. Long before I listen to anyone who thinks that they've got it all figured out. You know what? It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to have fears. But only if when things get real, we can do like Linus and drop that blanket. Drop the thing that we hold on to. Drop onto our false sense of security. And it said, simply depend on Christ, whom God chose to deliver to us in a manger 2,000 years ago. This time of year, don't don't worry about who likes you and who doesn't like you. Just because they give you a gift doesn't mean they don't like you. Just because they don't give you a gift doesn't mean that they do like you or don't like you. It means nothing. It's superficial. So many people give only to receive. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about whether or not they send you a card. Whether you get a text when you get all these texts on Christmas morning. Someone so didn't send me a text. They must not like me anymore. Don't worry about all of that. Just appreciate the gifts that you gave. 
not the gifts that you receive. Sit back and reflect, did I do all I could? Was I a Linus to someone at this time of year? Did I give something into their life? Don't complain that other people have lost the true meaning of Christmas. Instead, be like Linus, share with them the true meaning of Christmas. And the best way to share is not in the things that you say, but it's the way that you do and how you live your life. Especially at this time of year, everyone is watching you. Spend this time of year lifting up Jesus. That is our primary job as all Christians. John 12, 32, Jesus himself said this. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. He does the hard part. The Holy Spirit does the conviction. Remember, Linus didn't have all the answers, but he had the answer. Make sure you have the answer within you. Though Charlie Brown's questioning and Linus has answered the Christ being what Christmas is all about. If you notice in the story, the view and the attitude of everyone around them changed. That poor little pitiful tree, I have one on my desk at work. One simple little tree bent over one ball on it. You understand then the magic of that story. The tree never changed. At the end, you see this mighty tree, as big as one you'll find in a mall. The tree didn't change. The attitude and the perceptions of those around began to change. They began to see the true spirit of Christmas that Linus shared with Charlie Brown. And then they began to see and put it in reality in their own lives. Prophet Isaiah introduced us to Jesus more than 700 years before his birth. Isaiah 9 says, no, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those in distress. The people walking of darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, the light has dawned. The people rejoice before you, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. He will become wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And I notice this part I've never read. The sycamores have been failed, but we will replace them with cedars. In Isaiah 61, 3, Isaiah said to all who mourn in Israel, he would give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. He will give a joyous blessing instead of mourning. He will replace them as mighty oaks. Now begin to see what he wrote in that story and how that tree changed. The tree didn't change. The perceptions and the attitude changed. The faith in what could be was birthed. And it was already forgiven, foretold to us by Isaiah. That's what God wants for you. He wants your mourning to be replaced with joy. He wants the little tree that you think you have as nothing to offer. He wants you to see what you truly have to offer. At the end of the show, the kids gather with smiles and joy around the little tree. And they begin to sing a song. You remember what the kids sang? What did the kids sing? Don't go pay attention. They begin to sing. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. That's the true meaning of Christmas. God and sinners reconciled. God built the road that we couldn't build. Christ himself came to us to rebuild a way back to us, to God. You realize that the road that leads to Bethlehem, there were two ways. It created a road from God to Bethlehem, and it gave us an opportunity from us back to Bethlehem. And what do we meet in the middle? We meet our Lord, our Savior, our Christ Jesus. Our paths back to Bethlehem start here at the altar. We get to sing along with the angels, with the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Now he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the son of earth. Born to give them second birth. 
Will you today accept that gift given by God through His Son, Christ Jesus? The gift of a second birth. Like it says, born that you may no more die. That gift is found this morning at the altar. The gift was given to us in John 3, 16. But the gift must be received by us. This morning, your Heavenly Father stands just like I did, waiting for my child to come home for Christmas. Knowing that I would do whatever I had to do to get her home with me. Whatever needed to take place. God stood there. What do I have to do to have you home with me? I've got to send my son, then I'll send my son. God himself is there waiting for you to come back to him. Join to him this Christmas season. The altars are open this morning as you accept the gift of Christ within your life.